So I think that's enough to move on to the something new that you have to be told. And that's uh, what's called uh, De Broglie hypothesis. And um, so um, let me write it here. So um, I don't want to spend too much time on De Broglie hypothesis. I'll just uh, quote unquote drive the expression. So. Um, the, uh, by the way, um, I think he's a French physicist. I'm just never going to pronounce. Uh, does anyone here speak French, by the way? No one here does. I keep asking every semester. I don't know how to pronounce the word. I say De Broglie because when I try to say De Broglie, I can't really say it right. If someone knows correct pronunciation, teach me. I'm just going to say De Broglie. Um, so De Broglie hypothesis. This uh, he actually got Nobel Prize. For, the, for his uh, PhD thesis where he introduced this, which is probably why uh, a lot of physics theorists have a bad habit of introducing unjustified or some, uh, whatever. <laughs> so what, um, this is what the, uh, sort of a short version of what De Broglie did. He looked at what uh, Planck did, assuming this. He looked at what Einstein did taking this assumption and applying it even more broadly than Planck himself would have felt comfortable doing. And he looked at it and he thought, Einstein, he thought Einstein didn't go far enough. He thought he should have gone farther. He thought that, so this is a um, basis of what we call, um, basis of what we would call, what your lab manual calls, wave particle, duality of light. And De Broglie, uh, this is the short, very abbreviated version. He looked at it and he thought, um, he, Einstein didn't go far enough. In fact, he didn't have to say of light. He made this assumption, hypothesis, that this wave particle duality exist with everything. For example, if you have this, um, I was asking, you know, what is the wavelength of this? De Broglie would say that, yes, this does have wavelength. And we can actually assign a wavelength to it. And the way it's experimentally verified at first was, um, so based on the hype expression relationship that he guessed that, you can come up with a wavelength for electrons and protons under certain circumstances. And you can do an interference experiment with these, of electrons, protons, and neutrons. And when people did the um, Young's double slit interference experiment with electrons, they got the result predicted result that's consistent with the wavelength predicted by this De Broglie hypothesis. And you can actually get the relationship he was guessing at from here with, um, with the judicious uh, substitutions. And uh, because this is, I guess, somehow a universally applicable relationship that we just have to do some correct algebraic manipulations and substitutions to get rid of anything that's specific to light. So let's just start out with this. We have energy of electromagnetic wave, or I guess uh, I should really say energy of photon is equal to Planck's constant times frequency of the EM wave. So Planck's constant, we are going to keep it in the end. Um, and as we go through quantum mechanics, you will see this constant as the like, surefire hint that there, there's something quantum mechanical going on. So I would like to you know, rewrite the energy of light into something else so that I can quote unquote drive an expression that's more universally applicable than that light. How would I do that? Well, uh, energy of light, actually, this is the total energy because there's no mass. So you are thinking of this, right? This, in special relativity, you have this energy momentum relationship. The total energy squared is equal to the rest energy or the thing that's based on rest energy plus PC squared. 
right? With the light, there's nothing material there that you can slow down and measure. That's a rest of mass. So with light, you can say that this is a zero. And in fact, well, um, I still, um, this looks like a valid expression, right? E squared is equal to PC squared, or energy is equal to momentum times C. I'm not dividing anything by zero. I'm not multiplying anything by infinity. Seems fine to me. And this is actually a valid expression. So anything for any particle that's massless, you have this relationship that it's a, a total energy is momentum times C. And that's true of light. So this, I can replace it with, all right, um, energy of photon is the momentum of photon times C. All right, I, I don't think I really like this C because uh, speed of light kind of seems specific to light or special relativistic circumstances. Which, but, and I'm hoping that this can apply to something that's non-relativistic, that I can get rid of this C somehow. So on the right hand side, I see I'm running out of time, so let me just go through this quickly. I see this frequency, which I can rewrite in terms of speed of light. So you have this relationship. The speed of a wave or speed of light is equal to uh, wavelength times frequency, right? People remember that? So this, yeah, all right. So frequency, so solving this for frequency, frequency is equal to C over lambda. Um, so plugging that in, what you have is H times C divided by wavelength of electromagnetic wave. And once you get this far, then that's where you see that anything that's specific to light wave gets canceled out. So C gets canceled out. And you know, when I was uh, keep asking what is the frequency of this, it's like, what's the phrase? What's the frequency, can it? Some popular thing, I don't know, whatever. It's hard to say what the frequency could be or you know, what kind of experiment you do to measure a frequency. But if you are talking about wavelength, then there's an experiment you can do to measure it. Young's double slit interference experiment that actually measures wavelength directly. So you have this, momentum of photon is equal to Planck's constant divided by wavelength of the photon. So this is where you, De Broglie makes the bold jump that he makes. So, so far he hasn't introduced anything new. What uh, he would now introduce is that he would say, well, we don't need this, that this is a universal expression, that this uh, relationship applies to everything. It applies to light, obviously, and it applies to this ball. So it, it, let me just copy it over. He would say momentum is equal to h over the wavelength. This is what we are going to call de Broglie relationship. Because um, I'm not calling it hypothesis anymore because it, I mean, he turned out to be right. Somebody did this experiment. So, you know, momentum, it's uh, the regular old momentum. If you're doing non relative stick measurement, then this would be just the mass times velocity. So, if you have something that has a mass, and if I throw it up, then it has a velocity. Then it has a wavelength. So, if it, let's say I drop it, and let's say it's moving down at one meter per second, then I can calculate its wavelength. So, um, wavelength of this thing as it's dropping, and let's say it's moving at one meter per second, its wavelength would be, well, move over here. So it will be h over momentum. It will be Planck's constant divided by momentum, or h over mv. And what do you think that number will turn out to be? Small, large? Small. small. Yeah, it's actually fantastically small. Let's say this is a. I don't know, let's say it's 10 grams. 10 gram mass moving at something like one meter per second. If you plug in the numbers to get what the wavelength is, it's a fantastically small. Ah. All right, ah. sorry. Um. All right, let me just plug in the numbers. H divided by 10 grams times one meter per second. I should get something of length, hopefully. 
uh, hour, that's not right. Oh. Where's Planck's gone? OK. So 10 to minus 32 meters. Do people know the scale of small things? What's the smallest thing you know? Uh, that, well, that's a prefix. But what do you know physical stuff that's uh, you know, femtometers big? So femto is what, 10 to minus 15 or 14? Well, um, so angstrom is 10 to minus 10. Uh, anybody here know what, uh, what things are over an angstrom in size? Atoms, yeah. Size of atom is 10 to minus 10 meters. Um, uh, atomic nucleus is 10 to minus 14 meters. This is much, much smaller than that. And this is actually our explanation of why haven't you noticed this before? Well, for a macroscopic object, it's such a fantastically small number that whatever effects of interference or diffraction you might have tried to measure, you wouldn't have seen it. But the picture changes when you are dealing with the microscopic objects, because then this mass becomes much smaller. When you are dealing with the electron, let's say I have an electron that's moving at one meter per second, which is actually super slow for electron. But if I'm now dealing with electrons, electron mass, by the way, it's really hard to get electrons to move that slow. It's a really cool electron if it's moving that slow. It has a wavelength of, um, wait, what? Electron mass as a unit, maybe. Um, No persistence. <laughs> um, all right, 10 to minus 4 meters, or about a millimeter. That's something you can measure microscopically. And I, yeah, and I don't think the experiments did it have it that. Anyways, so um, yeah, so once you have microscopic things, that's when you can notice these effects a lot more. That's why sometimes you hear this um, expression that you know classical mechanics deals with a low speed, you now know why after we've done special relativity, low speed macroscopic objects. Special relativity deals with when things are moving fast, speed of light or something close to it. And quantum mechanics, people say it deals with microscopic small things. It's because the quantum mechanical effect, they only become apparent when your momentum is a small, which is a lot easier when your mass is a small. 